Stanford University. Okay, let's get started. Uh, so welcome to CS193G. Uh, I think this is lecture 12 by now. Um, today we have Stephen Parker. Uh, uh, Steve at NVIDIA's current role is as Director of uh, High Performance Computing and Computational Graphics. Uh, and before this role, he, w he led a team within NVIDIA Research to sort of stand up and, and invent optics, which is a general purpose ray tracing platform uh, that he's going to talk about today. And uh, before joining NVIDIA, Steve was, at, uh, was faculty at the uh, University of Utah. So please join me in, in welcoming uh, Steve. All right, so I'm going to um, uh, you know, give you basically, this is a semester long class that I teach at Utah. So we're going to do it in approximately an hour and probably um, throw in some additional details. So if I skip over something that, that I don't realize that you don't already know, please feel free to, to jump in and ask questions. Um, the, the main motivation here uh, to be able to do ray tracing on the GPU is that there are a lot of, of people that do ray tracing today, especially in film and product design, mostly offline rendering. And then there's a lot of people that claim that that's the, the future of graphics, that that's, you know, that that's where we want to be because we want the world, you know, the interactive graphics of the world to look like movies. And there's some debate about that second part, and it's a useful, healthy d debate. And again, probably another semester long class to fully debate that. But, um, but what we set about to do is to, to answer the questions about the future in the context of what, what could we do in, in the present. And so you know, maybe our ray tracing is the algorithm of the future, maybe it's not. But in the meantime, we can glean a lot of information uh, about, uh, about both doing ray tracing as well as uh, using ray tracing as a proxy for very non-uniform applications that run on a GPU. So there's a lot of problems that, that ray tracing exposes that, that, uh, that we've been able to address uh, either th uh, with algorithmically or with hardware and that are also applicable to other, other things. So first of all, um, how many of you have written a ray tracer before? All right, so this is... This is good. So this is uh, you know, kind of the standard rite of passage for a computer science students to write a, a ray tracer that, uh, you know, that runs for a few seconds um, and you know, gets some pretty pictures uh, or maybe runs for a few hours and, and gets a pretty picture. Um, or maybe if you have bugs, you know, runs for a few hours and then doesn't give you a pretty picture, which is the most common case. Um, and we can do that. Uh, but the, the main target is to actually uh, run a ray tracer in uh, ideally a 60th of a second. But uh, you know, ten, uh, a tenth of a second is, uh, is good too. So from a very high level view, a, a rasterizer, which is what the chip has been evolved to do for the last roughly 30 years. The, the architecture of, of, uh, of an NVIDIA GPU has its roots actually at the University of Utah in the building where I was previously had my office uh, to, um, uh, and it's the same basic Z buffer algorithm has, uh, has generated a, you know, a three decades long worth of, of hardware. And uh, at a high level view, all you need to do is figure out where, uh, take one triangle at a time, figure out where on the screen it hits, and for each of those triangles, for each of those pixels, um, in a modern pipeline, you would execute some shader, a fragment shader. And uh, a ray tracer is, is uh, canonically the other way around, where you loop over each pixel instead of each triangle and figure out what triangle is, is behind that. And um, both of them can generate uh, from this first bounce a, a, a identical image. The advantage of a ray tracer is that you can use that same operation recursively to be able to gather light from, for reflections, refraction, or even diffuse global illumination. So at a, at a high level, 
you know, rasterizers are fast. We have hardware that's, that's heavily evolved to be able to do that. But it, on the other hand, it needs some cleverness to, to be able to support complex uh, visual effects. And, and basically, you know, this is evidence to be true by an endless stream of, of uh, papers that have been published on the topic of how to do you know, XYZ obscure effect using uh, a, a rasterization pipeline. Whereas with a ray tracer, you don't get to publish those papers because you know, adding one line of your code does not make a paper. And so you know, adding a reflection or a refraction might turn into a paper for a rasterizer, at least it would have 10 years ago, but it, uh, uh, but it would not be in a, in a ray tracer. And so those, are, uh, those aren't paper generating ideas. What is a paper generating idea is figuring out how to make it fast. In particular, how to, to use um, some of the, the hardware that exists how to, um, to handle that uh, irregularity and how to uh, introduce hierarchical methods. Um, I guess animation is another key piece. That kind of look at the last five years of ray tracing research. Those have been some of the main topics. So uh, most people think uh, ray tracing is being invented in, in uh, 1980 by Turner Whidden, who's uh, now at uh, Microsoft Research. And um, this was the SIGGRAPH paper that that uh, resulted from that. In actuality, uh, there was a paper that precluded this in 1968 by Appel that described all the same basic algorithms. Uh, he didn't have a pretty picture. So, uh, uh, so most often, Witted gets uh, the, the citation, even though in reality it was uh, a lot earlier. Um, and this picture used um, uh, used a lot of the same techniques we use today. It has a bounding volume hierarchy, it has recursion, it has a, a Fresnel effect, it simulates refraction, it has procedural texturing. You know, from a, from a checkbox bullet point of view, it's a fairly state-of-the-art ray tracer. It ran, uh, this picture I think was about uh, uh, roughly 512 by 512, a quarter million pixels. Uh, it ran in 74 minutes on a VAX 11750. And uh, the same as a, uh, you know, jumping to the end, the same picture actually runs today uh, at uh, 40 frames a second at, at four times that resolution. So, um, so it, a few years later, um, Rob Cook and others uh, showed how to extend ray tracing to what's called distrib distribution ray tracing. Ba basically be able to use uh, Monte Carlo integration over different dimensions such as time and, uh, and, and uh, an area of a lens to be able to simulate things like motion blur, depth of field, soft shadows, and, and uh, anti-aliasing. And then a few years later, the seminal paper from Jim Kajia was, uh, that introduced the rendering equation, so showed how to use ray tracing in a, uh, as a full Monte Carlo simulation to, to be able to solve a recursive integral that accommodated all, uh, potentially all paths of light, or at least any that you could model. And uh, this uh, um, picture on the left was from his, his uh, uh, original scene. This was my attempt to actually reproduce it. And uh, um, it turns out that there's a couple bugs in his original implementation. And I, managed to even reproduce most of the bugs. There's still at least one more that's not quite the same. But, the, um, but we're going to use those as kind of three uh, fence guideposts as you know, three quality metrics. Um, the the, uh, the witted picture is just using a handful of rays per pixel. Um, rays that hit the background, there's just one. Rays that hit the, the metal, there might be two or three that shoot shadows or reflections or refractions. But for the most part, there's you know, order one rays uh, in each one of those pixels. Whereas the, the distribution ray tracing, because it integrated over these higher dimensions, such as time and, uh, and lens area, it required a, a lot more rays per pixel to get a converged solution, and, and roughly you know, 16 to 64, let's say order 100 pic, uh, uh, samples per pixel. And it uh, depends on what you're doing. If you had some dramatic shot with, with a wide depth of field, you might take a lot more. But most movies are actually on the order of 16 rays per pixel. 
they also have a lot of pixels, so that helps. But, um, uh, and then a, a, a full uh, path tracer in the Kajio world is uh, anywhere on, from on the order of 100 samples per pixel to 10,000 samples per pixel. And in fact, I did a, uh, a rendering once of, of the Cornell box, which is one of the you know, most simple benchmark scenes, at 100,000 samples per pixel at 4K resolution. And you can still see a little bit of the noise. So it's um, you know, without advanced uh, techniques to, to make those things converge fast, it takes a lot of samples in order to, to converge to the right answer. And using those three things as, as guideposts, you can, you can um, uh, understand what kind of the confusion is in the community about what ray tracing is. So um, you know, a lot of people, when they say ray tracing, they think of you know, fancy global illumination, soft shadows, and cinematic-like effects. Um, and then when somebody says interactive ray tracing, they, mean, they think, oh, it, that means they can do the film at you know, 30 frames a second. And that's not necessarily what uh, reality is. Right? We're, not, we're not, not quite there yet. So you know, doing a, a handful of rays per pixel uh, at interactive rates is, is, uh, is quite possible. And, uh, and eventually, over time, be able to add more and more rays per pixel to, to accommodate more effects is where we're, we're trying to drive. So um, there's a lot of different effects that you might want to achieve, um, such as uh, depth of field, soft shadows, um, uh, color bleeding, ambient occlusion, uh, uh, glossy reflections, refraction. Um, complex geometry is another place where ray tracers are often used because uh, it uh, it handles uh, large numbers of polygonal objects. It can also handle um, procedural geometry a lot more easily than a rasterization system. Uh, caustics, uh, subsurface scattering, motion blur, all of these are, are the types of things that, that might, people, might, might uh, make people reach for a ray tracing system. And so all of this has left, led, led to some uh, common myths. Um, so a lot of people, without going into the, the details of why, a lot of people really believe that rasterization is linear in the number of, of primitives. You throw one triangle to the screen is the mental model. And that's, um, and the ray tracing is sublinear in the number of primitives because it has this tree, this hierarchy that it traverses. Um, in reality, neither one of those are, are really true. Um, and so, you know, that type of comparison isn't really helpful. Likewise, the same thing applies. Yeah? Sorry, this might be a really stupid question. What does sublinear mean? Uh, sublinear, I mean less than O of n. So, you know, order, this is a, so, um, I mean, if you double the amount of time, the, the, double the number of primitives, it should take less than twice as much time to, uh, to get the answer. So. Um, the other myth is that ray tracing is linear in the number of pixels, that you know, because you have to step over each pixel, that it's going to take, you know, if you double the size of the image, it's going to take twice as long. And again, because of, of other, both the hardware as well as the techniques, that's not really true either. The other common myth uh, that's uh, often uh, 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 broadcast by the ray tracing people is that you know rasterization is just a you know 30 year long sequence of of hacks that have uh, culminated in in a you know an Nvidia GPU and um, and that's um, not quite true <laughs> um, the uh, but you know the other myth is you know ray tracing is clean right because you think of that uh, you know that ray tracer you wrote when you're uh, you know a a computer science undergrad, and it was you know a few lines of code, and you got a pretty picture. Um, but in reality, you know if you want to make it fast and you want to make it competitive with the rasterizer, they're both going to get really, really ugly. And uh, and so the other one is uh, that is another talk completely is that a lot of people that ray tracing is canonically the the embarrassingly parallel algorithm. If you've heard 
that term before, ray tracing is often used as the example that, uh, that it's, you know, it, it's uh, just easy to parallelize. And it turns out that if you want to, uh, especially if you want to drive it to real time, that that assumption breaks down. It's not embarrassingly parallel. But that's a whole other talk to be able to show that. All right, so with that intro, uh, why would you do ray tracing on a GPU? Well, it, at first glance, it seems um, to fit. Um, there's a lot of parallelism uh, on the, in a ray tracer, so there's, and there's a lot of parallelism on a GPU. So therefore, you know, it should work, right? Ray tracing is also computation bound. It's typically, an, you know, it's not an I.O. problem. It's, it's really just how fast can it, uh, can it uh, compute something. And any time that, that, uh, that, you know, wall clock times are in hours or days, you th you'd like to look for an opportunity to use a, a GPU to speed that up. Another uh, reason you might think that would be useful is that, you know, a GPU has all this uh, shading machinery for, you know, doing texture lookups and things like that that, that, uh, that, that could be leveraged. And uh, another reason you might want to do this is that um, a, uh, a GPU, you might be able to use a rasterizer and a ray tracer together to be able to, to kind of get the best of both worlds. And, uh, and that's a place where there's um, a, uh, a lot of potential uh, research left to be done. It's really, now that uh, we have a, a fast ray tracer that runs on a GPU, this is the first time in history that, that you have a high-speed ray tracer and a high-speed rasterizer on the same device. Until two years ago or a year ago, most of the ray tracing in the world was done on a CPU and most of the rasterization was done on, in the world was done on a GPU. So people have been trying for a while to do ray tracing on a GPU. Um, uh, one of the first ones was in uh, at SIGGRAPH 2002, that, uh, where uh, Tim Purcell and a few others uh, showed that picture, actually. Um, and it was basically use, abusing an OpenGL fragment shader to, uh, to be able to handle recursion and, and, uh, um, and all of the other things that are naturally associated with the ray tracer. And this was before CUDA, so it was, you know, there was a lot of, of um, stunt work that had to get done to make, to make it work. Um, that uh, has evolved to actually some work here at Stanford, at Utah, at UNC, and a few other places about how to make uh, the, the ray tracing algorithms more suitable for something like a GPU. So over the last 30 years, um, like I said, the hardware has evolved to do rasterization, and the um, and a ray tracer has evolved to take advantage of a CPU. And so we're trying to undo both of those paths of evolution simultaneously and figure out how to either change the hardware or change the algorithms or typically both in order to, to make that a better fit. So one of the first things that we, uh, we did is, as a, that, uh, that came out of the NVIDIA research was this uh, demo that was uh, written uh, by... Um, it, it built on the, the research ray tracing system, combined with our uh, a production scene graph system, that uh, that was all written in CUDA, and we decided to you know figure out how could we do this on a you know it was a scene that that was purchased from TurboSquid, and then uh, or the pieces were purchased from Tur TurboSquid and modeled. It has uh, a couple of million polygons and um, uh, light movable light sources and all the types of things you might want in a ray tracer. And let's see, Oops, this is the one I want. Come on. And this, um, unfortunately, does not run on my laptop. Um, we're still working on that. But the, um, it, uh, it ran on a, uh, uh, a desk side uh, system with four GPUs in it at about 25 to 40 frames per second at, at, at HD resolution. And it's uh, all the the things you might want in a, in a ray tracer, including uh, uh, glass, uh, 
for the headlights, uh, reflections, sh hard shadows. Um, there's no you know, shadow maps or things like that if you've had to deal with those before. And um, to show you why it was hard, now that you've done some CUDA programming, this is another view of, of the exact same scene, except that instead of drawing the picture, we draw the time. How long did it take to compute that pixel? And so um, the, the, bright, the, the whiter it is, the, the longer it took. And so you can see that some of the parts of, of the scene, even near fairly complex geometry, took almost zero time. But there are some pieces that, that took one to two orders of magnitude longer. Uh, and those two pieces might be right next to each other. That you might have uh, a ray that just barely misses the car, meaning it has to go up and down a tree to, to figure out only that it missed it. And that could be sitting right next to another uh, ray that just went clean past it and, and uh, not, didn't do any work at all. And so this is kind of an oversimplified um, description of, of, of what I mean when I say that we're trying to figure out how to map highly irregular parallelism to a GPU. Um, you know, all of the, th the things that hopefully uh, you're being taught in this class, you know, like memory coalescing and, and things like that, almost every single one of those assumptions goes out the window. So another demo that uh, you can actually download now um, off the web Hello. Is, uh, is called Design Garage. And it's a full path tracer. You remember the hardest one that we saw at the far right? It, uh, it randomly sends rays around that, that gather all of the potential uh, paths of light in a, in a, a few million polygon scene. You can download this and play with it. You can, there's like, I don't know, six or seven different cars and three or four different environments. And you can change the color of the car. And, and uh, it's all just a brute force physical simulation of light following photons around in a, in a scene. And um, it sparkles because we're showing it to you before we've reached you know, hundreds of samples per pixel. But it eventually converges after a, a few seconds of waiting there. So, uh, so as I mentioned, this is a full Monte Carlo simulation of light. Um, it, uh, for every pixel on the screen, it, it uh, traces a ray, finds an, an, an object where it hits. And then at each of those intersection points, it picks a random direction of which, from which to gather light. And, then, and so two rays that leave the neighboring pixels will both pick completely different random directions from that point on. And so from the second bounce on, they could be going completely different directions in space, which means completely different paths through, uh, through the data structures. And handling that divergence is, is basically the, the crux of the problem. And the, um, the short answer is, you know, we do a bunch of things to to try to minimize it, and then we hope that the hardware can handle the rest. So one of the things that we, we do, um, if you look at, at how a, a ray tracer is written, um, there's, it's the bulk of the time, probably 80% of the time, is spent in, in this loop, where you're traversing over a tree. And for each one of those trees, it's a, a typically a, a bounding volume hierarchy, you, s you need to perform a test and decide if the ray hits that, that node or not. If it does, you're going to make a decision of whether to, to traverse its children or whether to look at the individual triangles in, in that node. And so basically, it's this type of loop where there's, you need to know if, if it's a leaf node or not. And if it is, you'll do one operation to intersect the, with the triangles. And if not, You'll, uh, you'll look at, at the node itself. And 
Um, and so from the point of view of the hardware, there's this unpredictable sequence of, of node intersections and primitive intersections that, that, uh, that might be different from one uh, lane to the next in a, in, a, in, a, in a warp on a GPU. The other problem is that it's, um, it's a variable amount of execution time. We have no idea how many times it's going to go through that loop. It might be uh, you know, a, a dozen or it might be a thousand or just kind of the typical range. So let's look at how that would execute uh, on, uh, on a, any sort of, of SIMD hardware. So first we're going to just map one ray to, to one thread and let, let them uh, go. Let, let them uh, you know, do what they would naturally do. The, the SIMT execution model on the GPU will, will handle that. It will give you a correct answer. Um, but it, um, uh, suppose that each thread is executing this sequence of operations, you know, several node traversals uh, interleave with some primitive intersections represented by N and P. So you know, time goes left to right. Um, this is what we want. We want a packed, you know, if, if each one of these were we're completely independent units. This is the, the sequence of operations that we would get. However, when we map that to uh, a SIMD execution unit, the way that it works is that if, uh, if any of the, the lanes need to perform a node intersection, there it, the, that operation is going to be performed. And so, uh, and then it would leave the other one sitting around idle. So these blue line, these blue spots are essentially, you know, bubbles in the, in the execution pipeline where that thread can't, uh, because it wants to do something else, it needs to sit around and wait for the, for the other things to catch up. And so there's two problems that you see. One is a, a termination penalty where some of them finish earlier than others and then sit around waiting uh, for a long time for, the, for everything else to catch up. And the other is an execution penalty where there are these bubbles that are inserted in the pipeline because, um, because the, the SIMD unit can only do one of those two operations at any given point in time. And the, there's a couple ways to, to fix that. One of the ones that, uh, that was uh, published in a paper is uh, a speculative traversal where um, we turn, um, where we essentially reorder some of those operations. And so if any of the threads in a warp want to do node intersection, we, we might as well go ahead and, and do that. Since you have to execute that code anyway, so you can fetch that data, perform that operation, and then hope that you needed to do that, uh, that operation anyway later. And most of the time, um, this is successful. Uh, occasionally it does more work, but, it's, but in this sequence, you ta basically take one of these ends and push it into this slot, which uh, can then collapse a lot of, of the other pieces. And so in this uh, speculative execution model, it, um, it uh, actually, even in this simple case, has a pretty dramatic reduction on the number of, of these states that were executed. Another uh, technique that is uh, possible is to uh, just reorder the way that the code is written. And so the, the most straightforward thing to do that works great on a, on a single threaded uh, system is to, is to have two nested loops. So there's an outer loop that's going to you know, continue working on things and then uh, an inner loop that's going to perform traversal steps until it finds something. And then uh, another loop that's going to perform intersections until it, until it finds something. And it turns out that on a GPU, you can get a lot closer to that MIMD execution by uh, refactoring that code into a single loop. So you have a single loop where at each step we're going to perform uh, at each iteration of the loop, we're going to perform one step of traversal and one step of intersection, or up to one step of, of intersection. 
And the reason that, that, um, that this works is that you, in this case, you pay those execution type penalties twice. You pay it, uh, well, you pay it three times, I guess. You pay it in this loop, you pay it in that loop, and then you pay for it in the overall loop. Whereas in the second form, it will uh, more efficiently interleave those two different pieces. Another um, uh, thing to give you a flavor of what it takes to make a, a ray tracer go fast is, um, is to think about the, the state of, uh, you know, what, what state is being maintained in a ray tracer. Again, if you've written a, a, a ray tracer on a CPU, you'd have no hesitation with declaring an array that uh, one, one per thread or, uh, but on a highly parallel system, you might uh, get in trouble if, if you do that. And so, for example, the GTX 280 has up to 30,000 threads. The uh, Fermi has uh, 24,000 threads. And so that means any you know, one byte that you want to consume of per thread state is going to take 24 kilobytes on the device. And so having a, a large recursion stack of several megabytes like you might typically accomplish is not really a, a practical solution. Where this comes into to, uh, play the most is actually with uh, traversals. So traversing a, a data structure like we've referred to before is a recursive operation. It's often refactored into a while loop rather than using a language-based uh, recursion mechanism. But even with that, that while loop, you need to have some sort of state to remember where you need to go back in order to, uh, to resume that, that recursion. So for example, a KD tree traversal um, with this tree on the, the right um, would um, step through Would, would take a array and, traver and step through the, this structure based on uh, the intervals associated with that array. So the way it works is it starts at the top level and it uh, partitions that array into two halves, you know, front half and the back half. And that um, eventually we might need to, to look at both of those halves. But uh, to start with, we're going to look at the left half, and so we need to remember that to come back later to Z. And so we push that on a stack. And so uh, we do this recursively, and again partition the array into two halves. And the first half, um, we're going to visit node B, but remember to come back later to, to node A. And, no. Uh -oh. If we didn't find what we were looking for in node A, then it, it uh, will pop that node, or in node B, we'd pop node A off the stack and do that, you know, push and pop things on and off the stack until we find uh, the, uh, the triangle that that ray touches. So one of the ways of, of minimizing that uh, is of minimizing the, so that stack that we, it is something that has to be maintained for every single thread. And it can potentially be deep, it could, you know, potentially be 30 or more entries long. But most often it's not. Most often it, it uh, ends up with, you know, one or two things on the, on the stack. But we have to allocate memory for the, for the worst case. So another mechanism for dealing with that is to actually get rid of the stack completely. So this is a, a restart traversal where what we do is, is do the same thing that we did before, except don't bother um, pushing anything on the stack. And then when we get to the bottom, uh, in this case to, to node B, we simply start again at the top, but with, a, with the uh, interval of the ray starting from, from that point on. And if you make sure all the, the the rounding arithmetic is in your favor, it, this can actually work quite well. Um, and if you happen to find something in B, 
there, there's no need to continue on. But if you do it need to, if you don't find what you're looking for at that leaf, it starts again at the top and, uh, and then walks down the tree, in this case, to, to find A. And so the, you know, starts at the top, goes to a leaf. If it doesn't find, it starts again at the top and goes down. And this um, completely eliminates that, uh, that need for any intermediate storage. And so when this was done in OpenGL fragment shaders, this is the, the most common technique that, that was used. However, another uh, mechanism is, is to uh, actually use what's called a, a short stack. So we just use, let's say, a single register, where we're just going to keep the very top of, of the tree. And uh, in this case, you know, if that... Uh, if we overflow that short stack, we're going to drop that off. But this lets us um, have at least one, in this case, one thing on the, on the stack at any given point in time. And so that would let us uh, find, you know, look at both nodes A and B. In the worst case, uh, it actually reduces the number of, of restarts by, uh, by half. On average, it's actually uh, quite a bit better than that. So this is, um, so, and then another variation of this is to still keep the full stack around, but to actually just store the top entry of the stack in a, in a register. And then you avoid writing to that stack for the high frequency up and down uh, traversals through the tree, but, uh, but still have the full generality. And this works with both a BVH and a and a KD tree. If you've implemented a ray tracer, you may know what those are. But a, the restart mechanism that I mentioned before only works in a, in a KD tree. So another problem you might face if you wanted to write a, a ray tracer is, is how to handle things like virtual functions and recursion. And so the, if you, uh, you know, if you've got a high level bullet level description of CUDA, they would tell you, you know, it's really great, it's you know, highly parallel, it has lots of C++ features, about the only thing it doesn't do is virtual functions and recursion. And then, uh, and then you, know, you go up to a ray tracer and they said, oh yeah, we can, you, we've written ray tracing in PostScript and Haskell and just about every programming language on the planet. And really the only features you need from a programming language are floating point arithmetic, uh, virtual functions and recursion. So, um, so it turns out that even though CUDA doesn't support virtual functions at the moment, there's still uh, a way to, to get, what, to get that, that model. And uh, um, in, you can also take advantage of that to do something that would be more efficient than inherently uh, taking, uh, in, inherently supporting recursion. So for example, if you took this block of, of, of threads, and this is exaggerated to be large, but this block of threads, uh, some of them are going to hit the, the concrete, they're going to hit the pavement, and then they'll shoot shadow rays. Um, some of them are going to hit the, the paint, and they're going to shoot uh, reflection rays and also shadow rays. And then some of them are going to hit the headlights, and they're going to shoot uh, rays for the refraction and reflection and and also for shadows. And so even those, those three different things are, are very different, um, they all had the same conclusion. They're going to shoot some sort of, of rays, right? And so even though we might temporarily diverge to handle how concrete is different than paint that's different from glass, they're going to all come back to the same type of operation, which is to do that traversal and intersection over and over again. And so if you just supported recursion, you might, the most natural thing to do would be to do those independently. But there's some advantage of, of taking those common operations and merging them back into a, into a single uh, unified uh, 
packet of, of work to do. And this is really the kind of the core idea behind what optics is. So optics is a, uh, a, uh, a low-level API for doing ray tracing on the GPU. It provides a programmable set of operations that it's a lot like if you took the, the fragment shaders and vertex shaders from an OpenGL and figured out what are the basic operations you need to do to support ray tracing of a variety of different types, you know, all three of those things that we posted at the beginning for, for a start. And it's, um, it, um, is, it supports uh, rendering. Uh, it can also be used for, for baking uh, textures for doing uh, AI queries and a, and a bunch of other operations. And it's a, a set of fundamental operations that, that a ray tracer would perform. And so it's not a renderer, it's not, you know, optics by itself doesn't make pretty pictures, but the fundamental pieces of optics can be assembled to, to make pretty pictures. What's baking? Oh, baking is, um, most games don't have the, um, the horsepower to, to compute shadows or other lighting effects. And so what they do is they make a texture map where the, that lighting information is, is baked into that texture. And so they have a you know, several hour pre-process that you know, every time the artist makes some change in the game has to go and, and uh, bake all of that lighting information uh, for uh, uh, shadows or, or contact uh, darkening and things like that. Um, it's usually done with, or it's often done with, with ray tracing. And uh, uh, the difference between baking and uh, ray tracing an image is that with baking, the, the rays originate from the geometry, from all the points on the texture where you want the lighting information, instead of from a camera, from a virtual camera. Um, optics is highly programmable. It has, uh, it supports uh, shading with an arbitrary payload, or in other words, the information that, that you carry along with the ray can, is up to, to you, as a, you know, as a user of this SDK. And so it might be color, it might be an RGB, or if you're simulating car paint or some, something more complex, it might be, you know, say, 11 samples of the spectra at different wavelengths. Or if you're simulating sound, it might be uh, a, another set of frequency samples and maybe some phase information. If you're simulating electromagnetics, it might, might be, uh, also have phase information. And um, there's a set of operations that, uh, that, that create rays you know, for a camera or for baking or for other things. And that, uh, that then pack that resulting information into into some sort of output, typically a, a picture, but, but it could also be uh, something for further processing with CUDA. It also supports programmable intersection, so you can write uh, a little CUDA snippet that, uh, that does ray triangle intersection if you have a polygonal model, or you could do ray NURBS intersection, or um, how many of you have seen the mandel bulb? I should have got that one, but th there was a, um, uh, somebody created a 3D analog of the Mandelbrot set called the Mandel bulb, and basically I think they turned it into some sort of spherical, spherical coordinates. And within, so optics was out, just barely out at that time, and within two days of, of people having the, the Mandel bulb uh, algorithm posted on some forum, somebody had made a version of that in optics using the programmable intersection. So you could actually interactively look at these uh, uh, 3D Mandelbrot sets. Um, it's intended to be easy to program because, um, you know, even though we didn't go into all the details, hopefully I conveyed that, you know, there's a lot of thinking that has to go into how to make a ray tracer fast on a GPU. And so this is, the idea of, of optics is to give people the, the ability to just worry about the ray tracing pieces, and not worry about the how do you make it fast on a GPU. And so you just write code for one ray at a time. You don't worry about how they're bundled on the GPU or how they're, they're scheduled or all of those other pieces. 
and, um, and you don't have to worry about uh, acceleration structures. And at a, a high level, it looks a lot like a, a DirectX or an OpenGL, where there's a C-based API that runs on the CPU, that runs on the host. It has a simple uh, graph that describes objects and materials, acceleration structures. It also handles buffers, which are the, you know, basically one, two, or three-dimensional arrays that uh, define the unit of transfer between the host and the device. And then there's a, a shading system that actually uses the CUDA C uh, programming language. So you compile your shaders with, with NVCC instead of CG or something else that provide uh, programmable operations for materials, intersection, traversal, and so forth. And this is the, the full set of, of operations. Um, if, you're, if you've written stuff for a, a, a programmable rasterization system, there's you know, fragment shaders, vertex shaders, geometry shaders, now tessellation shaders, and they're rough analogs in a, a ray tracing world. In a ray tracer, you know, we care about what ray uh, we look at the any hit program gets executed whenever a ray interacts with an object. The closest hit program is kind of like a deferred shading model that gets executed whenever a ray hits the first object along that ray. Uh, there's rays, there's programs for determining uh, whether a ray hits an object or not, for creating rays from a camera, uh, for handling rays that don't hit anything at all, and for handling uh, exceptional conditions like uh, uh, stack overflows and, and things like that. And so the idea is you can implement any of those three things we talked about, you know, a basic witted ray tracer, a distribution pa uh, path tracer, or a uh, full uh, path trace uh, simulation. And, um, and the, which of those three you're doing is just a function of what those shaders do, and, and they plug into the same underlying infrastructure. See. So let's look at, uh, at one of those. Um, the closest hit shader is what you might, what, you know, if you've written an OpenGL program, that's the, the fragment shader. That's the thing that you would typically see. You know, it's what happens when a, when a ray hits the object that, uh, that is closest to the origin of the ray. That's why it's called the closest hit shader. And it, uh, uh, it doesn't get executed, you know, if the ray continues on, you know, down here, it doesn't, doesn't uh, take into, it doesn't get executed for any of those objects. And then that, that, that program that you write can trace new rays. It, it could shoot a ray for a reflection and then combine that with the, the answer that it, re it returns up the stack. It could shoot a ray for a shadow. To, to, the easiest way to determine shadows in a ray tracer is to shoot a ray to the light source and see if there's anything between you and the light. And if there is, then, then it's a shadow. If, and if there's not, then it's uh, fully lit. And that's only a slight oversimplification. But it's literally about three lines of code to add shadows to a, to a ray tracer. And when I, so when I taught the, the ray tracing class at Utah, I'd always you know, tell the students that that you know, they had just taken the OpenGL class. And so um, you know, I pointed out that shadows were the last assignment in the OpenGL class. And they were the first assignment in the ray tracing class. So, so that, if you've written both of those before, um, uh, kind of calibrates why people are attracted to that as far as e being easy to use. So in this case, it, uh, you know, in our little cartoon version of it, it shoots two rays, one for a shadow and one for a reflection. And the, the simplest version of this, this is actually a box on a plane. It'll actually look like a box a, on a plane shortly. But uh, the simplest hello world kind of, uh, of closest hit uh, program or, or shader is, um, looks like this. This is the, the entire code with the exception of a pound include at the top. Um, where um, there's 
uh, some declarations of, of the, the payload or the per ray data that we're gonna, gonna track with that ray. And then we just take um, a, a thing called a shading normal that was computed in one of those other programs. And in this case, we're just gonna take that, uh, transform it to the right space, and then rescale it from negative one to one to zero to one. So it'll, it'll be a color. And that, um, that, believe it or not, is what produced that picture. Um, you can take that and extend it, and I don't have all the, the code for this because it, it fills up an hour talk all by itself. But you can take that and with another uh, 10 or so lines of code, or maybe even eight, you can uh, produce a, uh, a simple shading uh, mechanism. Add a couple more lines of code and you can add shadows to that just by shooting another uh, another ray. Um, you can then add a, a couple more lines of code and you can add a reflection. That's kind of subtle, right? But there, there is a reflection there. Uh, you can add a couple more lines of code and use a, a texture map for the background. And you notice that automatically the, the reflection, you can actually see the, the background in, the, in that reflection. We can make it a little bit more physically based by computing that reflection dynamically, adjusting it uh, per ray. Uh, you can add a procedural texture with a few more lines of code to alternate colors based on some function, in this case, you know, using uh, integer truncation and uh, uh, in order to determine whether it's a crack in the tile or not. Um, or you can add a full uh, procedural uh, texture. So in this case, this is a, a, a texture that was written by Larry Gritz a long, uh, I don't know, about in the 80s, I think, called Rusty Metal. And uh, it uh, basically uses a, a noise function to determine whether it's in one of the rusty spots or one of the shiny spots. And then uh, we'll either shoot reflection rays or, or not, depending on which of those regions it, it is in. Uh, that uh, uh, glass obelisk on the, on the right is actually a, a procedural primitive. It's a, it's a convex hull that's just defined by uh, let's see, eight planes rather than, than uh, all of the triangles that are, then rather than decomposing into triangles, it just takes the eight planes and determines when the rays uh, enter and exit the convex hole that's defined by those eight planes. And that's also uh, fits on a single slide. And the, even the, the program for creating the rays is a procedural, is a procedure that, that you can write. And so while all of the, the ones we talked about so far used a pinhole camera, to, to shoot rays in a, in a uh, what's called a frustum, uh, or kind of a, a square-shaped cone. We can also, in this case, use it to, to send rays in a, in, a, in a spherical pattern, to, and this would actually create then an, an environment map that could be fed into other, other parts of, of the pipeline. So, The, um, the way that those get executed on, on the hardware is through, a, well, through a, we'll talk about those separately, I guess. So there's through a continuation mechanism. So uh, the, what it looks like from the GPU's point of view is you need to do some part of a CUDA program or some part of a CUDA snippet. And then you need to stop and you need to do something else. And uh, su such as traversal or uh, traversal and intersection. And you might need to stop that in order to execute part of a closest hit shader. And eventually you'd come back and, uh, and finish up all the operations that you'd started. So the way that we do that is producing a, uh, a state machine. And by analyzing the, the program, we can determine the, the variables that are live when we start one of these operations, remember what those are by saving them on a stack, and then uh, executing a, a different set of states and eventually coming back to that, to, to that state and resuming the, the program that we had started from that point on. 
And the way that Optics does this is through a, a local stack and through analyzing uh, the PTX that, that comes out of this. I don't know, have, have any of you looked at the PTX that comes out of NVCC? So uh, we'll, uh, we'll chastise Jared and David for falling down on the job. So, but the, the, the PTX, PTX is a, is a high-level abstract assembly language. So the way that the CUDA tool chain works, when you type NVCC, um, it produces, the, there's a high-level compiler that produces PTX, which is sort of like, it's not as bad as assembly language, but it's nowhere near as good as, as C code. But it, you know, it's a se sequence of instructions that it, that's uh, sort of a semi-human readable abstract uh, uh, assembly language. Uh, and then that PTX is, uh, is then further compiled to a specific device. Uh, so the, the actual instructions that run on you know, a Fermi versus a GT200 uh, can uh, be quite different. And so what Optics does is actually takes and intercepts that code at the PTX level. And you can see the PTX if you're curious. If you type nvcc-ptx in your CUDA code, it'll produce a you know, foo.ptx and it will and you can look at that, and um, if you stare at it long enough, you can actually read it and understand it. Um, and uh, so we take that PTX, and we take a bunch of PTX from a lot of different places representing each of those uh, CUDA functions, and we um, perform all the analysis to, to save the live state, to, to store that state on stacks, and to then interpose each of those into a, into a single state machine. So the main loop of, of optics is what's called a, a mega kernel. It's just going to loop through each of those states, processing one of those or one part of one of those functions at a time. The other piece that that main loop does is, is uh, that is a useful technique if you have uh, things that you're working on that are highly irregular, such as ray tracing. And this is um, a uh, we use a, uh, what's called a persistent warp, where instead of launching a full grid of threads, we launch exactly enough threads to, to exactly fill the, the machine. So you can query you know, how many uh, SMs there are and how many blocks, and you can launch uh, a number of one CTA per SM, where each one of those CTAs exactly fills the SM. And, so in, and then each of those will, uh, just be in a loop where it pulls work off of some global queue and performs it and then goes back and, and gets more work off of that queue. And um, this helps um, both with the, uh, the uh, it helps because the hard, especially on the GT200 class hardware, uh, wasn't really uh, designed to be able to handle that wide of a variation in, uh, in workload from one thread to the next. But it also helps with those termination panels that we talked about. That, you know, some rays are just done early. And so in this case, we might as well just get started on the next one rather than sitting around waiting for that one that's gonna, gonna transition through a thousand different states. Um, so the, those get, all those pieces get compiled into a single kernel that contains all of the different pieces of code. Uh, it contains all of the, the shaders for the glass, for the, you know, the concrete, for the, for the paint, and everything else like that. And you could have done that differently, right? You could have uh, had waves of kernels that, that process the rays. But uh, we did some experiments and found that this uh, mega kernel approach actually worked quite a bit better. Uh, it, uh, they're huge programs. They're, they're thousands, if not tens of thousands of instructions long. Uh, the, the PTX that comes out of them is um, technically human readable, but it's, you know, by size is not, is not readable by any one human. And, um, but, the, but the GPU can still handle this uh, um, uh, gracefully. So the the way to think of this, um, of this state machine is that there's some operations that need to be performed. And we're going to abstract it to just a few of the key ones here. 
So we're going to start by uh, creating a ray with a pinhole camera. And we're going to do some traversal on that ray. Once we find an intersection, we're going to shade it. And then we're going to, and then we, if, it, if that shader produces a shadow ray or a reflection, it might go back to traversal and you know, go through this iteration a few times and then uh, eventually go back up to, to generate another ray. And the way that that really works in terms of, of states on object is we break those pieces into multiple different states. So state one, where we start, is the, the, all of the pinhole camera operations up until the time it, it needs to trace a ray. Then when, we, then when we trace a ray, we sort of stop the execution of that part of the program by saving all of the registers that were live at that point, and then transition to the traversal state. The traversal state you know, is going to do some, some loops and iterations in it till it finds a, a, an intersection point. And, um, and then it will invoke, say, the a Fong shader that will uh, compute some lighting, but then it wants to shoot a ray for a reflection or for a shadow. And so that is going to, to then uh, potentially pause that program, save all of its registers on a stack, and transition back to, to traversal. And um, uh, once we reach the end, usually through some maximum depth or through some other stopping criteria, it will unwind those states and eventually return back to the programs that it, that it had abandoned. And so in this case, you know, back to the to the rest of the Fong shader, and uh, you know, it also could, you know, there could be multiple ones of uh, multiple of those transitions. And then eventually all the way back up to the top where the pinhole camera started. And we have this color that, that resulted from all of the recursive evaluations of these different rays. And we take that color and write it into an output buffer or, some, or someplace else that will eventually show up on the screen. So this is almost literally the, the, what the main loop of optics look like. Uh, aside from the syntax, we could have cut and just cut and pasted it. Um, it's just an, a loop that, ha that is going to execute each one of these states uh, and there's, there's a big switch statement in it. And so let's look at how that might run on a GPU. Uh, if we start in, uh, everybody starts in state one, right? So that's nice and, and parallel. It's nice, you know, everybody in a warp, we're going to imagine our, our warp is only eight wide, the PowerPoint version of, of a GPU. Um, and they all start in state one, so they're all going to execute uh, that state nicely. They're all going to transition to state two. Um, but after, and, and then let's say they all transition to state three. But now we have, oh, all right, there's one more step in here. So, so now, so they all, so the, all the arrays so far are going together, right? They're going from one state to the next. But then when we get to a point, eventually, where some of the arrays want to do one thing and some of them want to do something else. So the way that um, that, that, if you wrote that loop that, you're, that we showed at the beginning, while true switch state, what will happen is the GPU will execute um, one of those states and then the other, um, but it will always It'll just, uh, it'll mask off in this case, you know, three and then four, or maybe it's four and three, and you can't really uh, decide which one is which. Um, but now the problem is the next time we go through that loop, oh man. My aggressive slide cutting, I think, cut out one too many slides. <laughs> but uh, so, so now that we have transitioned to different states, eventually, uh, if we just move one state forward in each iteration, these are going to be forever out of sync. Right? They're going to be three and four, and then, uh, and then in the next iteration, uh, this will go to five, that one will, and the red ones will go back to two. And then eventually they'll all go back to five. And so what we'd like to do is, is somehow manage that by scheduling the order in which we do 
uh, those state transitions. Instead of just advancing them one per iteration, we pick which one of those states we want to execute next. And the advantage you can get by doing that is actually uh, pretty substantial. This is a, um, uh, another one of those, so it's this picture, it's the reproduction of the, uh, of the witted scene. And you zoom in and um, you see uh, some of the costs uh, that, co that are caused by, by uh, this state divergence, even in something pretty simple like this. And um, if you pick intelligently which of those states you're going to transition to next, on the hopes that other threads will eventually come and join you, you can actually reduce the time quite a bit and also reduce the total number of state transitions quite a bit. Overall, um, this is, a, is that benchmark. These are the actual states. That, you know, in, this, in that simple of a scene, there's actually 44, 45, I guess, different states where one of them is a no-op, one of them is the exit, you know, the, the end condition. But there's um, all of these uh, different transitions that it's going to make as it intersects against uh, primitives and uh, does checkerboards or glass or metal and, and shoot shadow rays and not shoot shadow rays and do acceleration structures. It's going to transition around between those different operations. And if you just do it naively, the red bar shows how many transitions, how many of those states will get executed. But if you pick intelligently which one of them is going to get executed next, it, uh, the, it reduces the total number of, of uh, executions to, to the blue bar. And ideally, we'd like them to always be full, always 32 rays at a time. Um, but that's, um, we haven't, uh, that's still a research problem. So, and this is the same movie that we saw before, and this time showing the divergence um, where black are ones that are further apart, and white is the, uh, where we always have a full warp of, of rays to, to do at a time. And uh, so even though uh, we've done this scheduling operation to be able to get uh, as much work into a warp as possible, we still have to live with uh, some divergence that remains. Yep. What are those like triangles that you described? Um, those are uh, the ones on the ground. Uh, they're, uh, they're places where you make an arbitrary decision of, of, in one, uh, of which to do next. And so we don't, in that case, don't have a great tiebreaker. And so it, it kind of randomly picks one or the other. So optics, uh, if you're familiar with CUDA, uh, it's uh, it, you know, straightforward to, to, to use and download. It's built on the same infrastructure. It's available for free at, at uh, NVIDIA's developer site, um, including a bunch of, of code samples that show you how to do different things. All the shaders are written in, in CUDA C, so you have you know, templates and pointers and, and that type of thing. But for the most part, it's a lot like using a, a CG-based system for, um, uh, for rasterization. And with that, I will be happy to answer any questions you have. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.